Good evening, and welcome to a celebration of the life of Professor Joe Crea. I'm Frank Aquila, the chairman of the board of uh, trustees of Brooklyn Law School. All of us in this room know no other member of the Brooklyn Law School faculty has had a greater impact on this law school and the people of this law school than Joe Crea. Tonight, we come together to remember and celebrate his career and legacy. The only thing that Joe loved more than this law school was his daughters and his family. So it is my honor to recognize and welcome Joe's family. Catherine Crea, Regina Mizaleski, and her husband Ronald, Lorraine Crea, Elizabeth Crea, a member of the class of 1998, and her wife, Gloria Greco, also a member of the class of 1998. Joe's oldest grandchild, Paul Mizaleski, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, I'm sure, uh, will speak in a few minutes on behalf of the entire family. Paul, a lawyer like his grandfather, is a federal prosecutor in New Mexico. He's also a US Army veteran who served in Iraq, where he was awarded the Bronze Star twice for his valor. We will also hear from many others, including a number of Joe's former colleagues and a former student. As we will hear, their lives and careers have been indelibly changed by Joe's influence, his counsel, and his unwavering devotion to this law school. In the more than 60 years of his extraordinary career as a law professor, Joe Crea had a lasting impact on generations of Brooklyn Law School alums. He played a major role in modernizing our curriculum, raising our standing and reputation on a national level, and he was always an advocate on behalf of our faculty. Joe Crea advised more than a half dozen deans including our newest dean, Michael Cahill. That is why the Board of Trustees decided more than a decade ago that as a lasting and fitting tribute to Joe, the formal title for our dean would henceforth be the Joseph Crea Dean of Brooklyn Law School. Evidence of Joe's enduring impact has been the outpouring of hundreds of best wishes and tributes from alumni throughout the world on the occasions of his birthday. At the reception which follows this program, I invite you to view a book of photos and memories that we compiled for Joe's family to mark a recent birthday. It is moving and of course, often a humorous testament to the power of Joe's legacy, which we celebrate this evening and will, of course, remember for decades to come. On a purely personal note, one of my fondest memories as a law student was when I had Professor Crea in 1980 for bills and notes. I think I speak for all of you when I say that none of us will ever forget the first time we heard Joe Crea utter his signature adage, never drop your briefcase and run. Now I would like to call upon the Joseph Crea Dean of Brooklyn Law School, Michael Cahill. Dean Cahill will present a proclamation from Borough President Eric Adams and then share some of his personal recollections. Dean Cahill. Proclamation is here, but I don't want to mess it up before giving it to the family, so I have a copy of what it says here, and uh, I will read it uh, for you. Uh, Borough President Adams regrets that he's unable to join us uh, tonight, but uh, I think his words will, will speak for themselves. Uh, Whereas it is a time-honored Brooklyn tradition to recognize those individuals that demonstrate an outstanding commitment to academia and the study of law, and whereas all of Brooklyn joins today to celebrate the legacy of the late Professor Emeritus Joseph Crea, who gave dedicated service to our nation as a second lieutenant during World War II, and who joined the faculty of Brooklyn Law School in 1948, just one year after having graduated from the same law school, 
and who devoted 60 years to teaching nearly every single course in the law school's curriculum, advising more than a half dozen deans over that time, and whose spirit of excellence has inspired generations and stands as a testimonial to all residents in our community. And whereas, on behalf of all Brooklynites, I salute Professor Crea, a Brooklyn native and graduate of Brooklyn College and Brooklyn Law School, for modernizing Brooklyn Law School's curriculum, I commend him for helping to raise the law school's standing and reputation on a national level. I acknowledge his having the Joseph Crea Dean Chair and the Joseph Crea Reading Room in the law school library named in his honor. I pay homage to the legacy of Professor Emeritus Joseph Crea, and I thank everyone present for all that they have done to help our communities move forward as one Brooklyn. Now, therefore, I, Eric L. Adams, President of the Borough of Brooklyn, do hereby proclaim November 6, 2019, Professor Emeritus Joseph Crea Day in Brooklyn, USA. Just about an hour and a half ago, I was talking to uh, my former colleague, now retired, Arthur Pinto, who I know is here, Arthur, where are you? Um, about this upcoming event, and Arthur said, Joe was the ultimate giver. Uh, and I said, you just took the first line of my remarks. Um, some other people are gonna talk to some particular things that Joe did for Brooklyn Law School, but I'd like to talk generally about Joe as a giver. Um, as many of you probably know, it's common in philanthropic circles uh, to talk about multiple ways to give, and the usual formulation is to say you can give your time, your talent, or your treasure. And uh, Joe Crea, of course, gave all three of those things in spades. Uh, perhaps the most uh, meaningful and remarkable of those is the way in which he gave his treasure. Uh, because to put it mildly, uh, Joe was not born into or around money, uh, and uh, he could surely have been forgiven uh, if his impulse were, once he had any, to cling to it. Uh, but that wasn't Joe. He was wise enough to understand that one great thing about money is that you can use it, and that there's no more worthwhile use than spending it to benefit someone else. Of course, as Dean, I am pleased and proud that Joe saw fit to give large amounts of his treasure to his law school. Uh, but on a more personal note, I'm more touched at the small gifts that Joe would gratuitously give my children when they were young, not for any holiday or anything else, but just because he saw things and thought they would like them. Um, that was Joe giving his treasure uh, such as he had as it came to him. As to talent, it would be hard to find one that Joe didn't have. A penetrating intellect, far-reaching curiosity, an unbeatable work ethic, and perhaps most of all, a gift for making human and humane connections with others, students, faculty, anyone he came across. Uh, as just a small example of those qualities, hardly the most meaningful, but one I have direct experience with, I can say that Joe read everything and shared it with everyone. When I joined the faculty in 2003, when Joe would have been 88 or 89, uh, I was teaching health law, and uh, I soon found that I would receive by inter-office mail envelopes that had in them advanced unpublished opinions from various New York courts on various health law matters, medical malpractice, hospital liability, all sorts of things, because Joe would get all of the opinions, look all of them over, and distribute them to all of his colleagues based on the subject matter areas they taught. So my tax colleagues got the tax cases, the torts colleagues got the torts cases, I got health law cases. Now, later on, some years later, Joe slowed down a bit, he wasn't getting and reading all of the opinions anymore, but he was still a voracious consumer of 
all kinds of newsletters and magazines, and I would still get by interoffice mail articles on health law related subjects from time to time, which was mostly uh, at not only an impressive but a delightful thing, although on occasion it could be uh, a little confusing or worse, uh, given that one time, for example, I got an interoffice mail, and you know, usually he'd send me something, it might have a post-it note on it that would just say something like Cahill from Crea. But, you know, he didn't always remember to do that, and sometimes I'd just get a pile of articles. One time I got an inter-office envelope, I opened it up to find inside, no post-it note, just an article with the headline, How to Lose That Belly Fat. <laughs> so I'm going to assume that was from Joe, uh, rather than some other concerned colleague trying to tell me something. Um, but of course, notwithstanding his monetary generosity uh, and his prodigious and far-reaching talent. Uh, as fate had it, as it turned out, the gift Joe was given in greatest abundance was time. And uh, as with all of those other gifts, he passed that gift on to all of us. He wasted none of it. As you have just heard, I am uh, the Joseph Crea Dean. Uh, a chair that is held by the dean while serving as dean. Uh, and in one sense, that is completely appropriate uh, because, as Frank just noted, Joe for years served as a kind of shadow dean, as he was sometimes described, to literally every dean we have had but the first one. Um, it's been remarked more than half a dozen, well, I am the ninth. Joe has advised all of the deans. Um, so it is completely appropriate that the deanship would be named after him. Um, but at the same time, I find it slightly ironic that the deanship is named after him because one of the central lessons I take from Joe's career, his life, and his relationship to Brooklyn Law School is deans come and go. But the faculty, and particularly loyal and dedicated faculty like Joe Crea, are the backbone of the institution. He was, as Frank said, as important to the history of this school as any dean or any other single person. It is our collective good fortune that we inherit his many gifts and contributions. And it now falls on those of us who remain to sustain and nourish that inheritance. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Professor Kaplow, Stacey Kaplow. And by, if I did the math a little more uh, agilely, I don't have to be here too many more years to equal Joe's number of years uh, here, believe it or not. So uh, with the exception of Dean Cahill, um, I think all of us who are going to be at the podium this evening are not only senior faculty and senior members, distinguished members of the board and Joe's family. We're the people who have senior citizen Metro cards. Um, but once upon a time, uh, we had the pleasure of working side by side with uh, Joe as junior members of the faculty. Uh, so it's my privilege and honor to speak briefly about him when we're all gathered together to uh, remember the unforgettable character he was. So I just picture in your brain a big headline that says September 1976. That was when I came here for the first time. I'd never been to Brooklyn other than the day I was interviewed. What was going on then was Mao died, Carter debates Ford, yet Everett beats Gulagong and Connors beat Borg at Forest Hills. Ali beats Norton and Charlie's Angels debuted on TV. I mean, they're doing a remake now. So the least headline worthy event of that September was the day I arrived at Brooklyn Law School. I was. Um, a 27-year-old public defender who had basically spent the last few years in holding pens and dingy halls of Manhattan criminal court, a real fish out of water in a strange universe where people called each other professor, and everyone seemed a lot older than I was. For many of you in the room, I'm going to just name a few names of the people who were here when I started, and probably many of you will remember them. Gershenson, Meehan, Gilbride, Hoffman, Young, Ronane, DeMeo. Those were the people that I were my new colleagues. 
The then younger faculty were Marty Hauptman, who I think is here tonight, Nancy Fink, Gary Schultz, and the late Dick Farrell. There were only a handful of women, and a great many students were older than I was. There were classes on Friday night, if any of you remember. And my office, by the way, was now the copy room on the eighth floor. And I had to put a poster of a window in there just to make sure I knew where I was. So on my first day, no one will be surprised to know that it was Joe, whose office was basically right across the hall, who came, was the first person to come to say hi. He was welcoming, he was fatherly, reassuring, and helpful. I don't know, you know, I had no idea who he was, but, but that wasn't long for me to find out that this was the first of many, many occasions where he was an advisor, where he spent time chatting in my office for an extended visit Probably some of you know that when Joe arrived in your office, you kind of had to pause everything else you were doing and uh, be ready for a long chat. Um, he immediately became a friend and a colleague who didn't, was always 100% supportive of me personally for the next 30 years while he was here, just as he supported every single person in this room, whether you were faculty, uh, students, staff, and all the people who are here to remember him today. I think you're going to find that many of us use the same exact words to describe Joe. I've already heard it in multiple ways how Joe is a giver, and that was number one on my list of uh, nouns to describe him. I'd include in that conscience and protector. My adjectives of choice are loyal, principled, forthright, and empathic. He taught so many different subjects over the years, and he had such a wealth of knowledge and shared it with all of us. Of course, like all of us, he wasn't perfect. He trailed the smell of cigars for years, and nobody really wanted to go into his office because of that until Liz Schneider cajoled him to quit. I'm sure others had a role in it, but Liz takes full credit for that. He was the perfect shop steward, fighting for us with successive deans uh, to make sure the faculty was fairly treated in all ways. And more importantly, though, I think he was the champion for the, his students, for all students, especially those who didn't succeed the first time but needed a second chance. He was the moral spine of the faculty. And like Dean Cahill says, I, felt, I feel like he was the dean uber, uber deans, dean uber alles. He influenced us all to be better at our jobs and better to each other. He taught us to care about our students, to worry about them, to treat them with respect, to be available to them, to listen to them, and above all, to teach them well. Today, this is the ethos of Brooklyn Law School, of every faculty member, all administrators and staff. Everyone who studies and works here feels the support and care of the community. He also taught us we shouldn't take ourselves too seriously. Although probably no one today is as quotable as Joe, we all try to make an indelible impression. We try to compete with, with him uh, on our students so that at a 25th reunion, which I've now gone to and met lots of people at their 25th reunions, um, and even beyond that, we hope we, we will hear, as Joe always did, how much our former students appreciated us while at Brooklyn Law School and carried that warm feeling into their personal and professional lives. Joe, and, Joe is someone who, about whom it's likely that everyone in this room has many stories about how he touched and improved their lives. He created legacies. Uh, here's one example that probably most people didn't know about. I certainly didn't. When she first arrived at, at Brooklyn Law School, Joe gave Professor Marcia Garrison, who regrettably can't be here to tell the story herself, a dog-eared copy of that, tom, uh, that top 10 hit causation song, which was apparently attributed to William Prosser, I'm sure a very musical guy, which she turned into an annual end of semester sing-along in her torts class. This year, Marcia, who recently stopped teaching full time, passed along a copy of the song to our newest torts teacher, Jamie McLeod, a next generation starting a new tradition. So instead of my stories, everyone who knows Joe, please either close your eyes or pretend you're closing your eyes and picture him for a moment. Maybe you can do that. Oh, the pictures are gone, but you can certainly remember what he looks like. Think of your own story, hear his voice, recall one of his aphorisms, remember one of his kindnesses. For pe few people live as long or as well as Joe did or saw the changes in this institution as clearly as he did. He was part of this community longer than anyone before him or likely anyone, or anyone is likely to be in the future. He hasn't been in the building for quite a while, but he was never forgotten as he reached one record-breaking birthday after another. 
Now that he's truly gone, we can honor him by recognizing his impact and his legacy in the many ways he helped us individually and as a community to be our best selves. So goodbye to Joe. We've said goodbye to him already at his funeral and after, but this is sort of the official goodbye. So wherever he may be, I'll have to say it. I'm sure he's got his briefcase because he's the one person who wouldn't forget it. Illegitimi non carabundum uh, or carundum, whatever those bastards are, don't, for, don't forget about them. Hi, I'm Michael Gerber, and I represent the younger members of the faculty. <laughs> but I don't know where my Metro card is. So, two weeks ago, Dean Michael Cahill delivered the best dean's inaugural address I've ever heard. And Michael shared some observations about the essential features of Brooklyn Law School that make it the remarkable institution that it is. As he was speaking, I couldn't help thinking that he was also describing the essential features of Joe Crea, whose life and career we celebrate today precisely because of Joe's role in making the law school the remarkable institution that it is. Now, Michael noted that Brooklyn Law School is a school of opportunity that has transformed not only the lives of our students, but their families for generations to come. Joe's own personal and professional story is the best evidence of the truth of that statement. By day, <clears throat> Joe has been described as a born lawyer and a born teacher. But you know, Joe wasn't born a lawyer or a teacher. He was born in 1915 and spent his early years on Manhattan's Lower East Side in an apartment above a stable. When he was a teenager, his family moved to the Gravesend section of Brooklyn and he attended Bay Ridge High School as an evening student. By day, he drove a bread truck and that is how he discovered his affinity of the law. One day, as he drove past a farm, there were still farms in Brooklyn at that time, he spotted a pile of discarded books. He stopped the truck, walked over, and took a look. This turned out to be a pile of law books, and two of them in particular caught his eye. These were treatises on corporate finance and bankruptcy reorganizations. He took the books home, he poured over them, and came to the startling realization then that even during the depths of the Depression, the fee for reorganizing even a small railroad was $2 million. <laughs> Legend has it that right then and there, Joe decided law school was for him. <laughs> now, this story has been retold so many times that many believe it to be a myth. But it's not, and I have the proof. Many years ago, Joe gave me two of those books. And they're right here. So now we have proof positive that Joe's serendipitous discovery of those books inspired him to become a lawyer. But Joe didn't immediately embark on that path. As Joe might say, the barrel would have to roll around a few times, maybe a few dozen times, before he could get around to realizing his dream. Following high school, Joe entered Brooklyn College, which he attended, when else, at night, while working during the day as the chief clerk for the Selective Service. Before finishing college, though, he enlisted in the Army and rose from private to second lieutenant by the time he was discharged. When he returned from the Army, determined to make up for lost time, and even before he finished his college degree, Joe enrolled in the BLS Evening Division and returned to his day job at the Selective Service. He also met and married his beloved wife, Regina, and started a family. In those post-war days, veterans were permitted to sit for the bar even before they graduated from law school. So Joe took and passed the 1947 July bar exam and completed his coursework in time to graduate from the law school the following October. Then he re-entered Brooklyn College and earned his BA degree by, of course, <laughs> attending night classes. <clears throat> Brooklyn Law School opened professional doors not only for Joe, but for succeeding generations of his family, including his children, his daughters Elizabeth, Regina, Catherine, Lorraine, his son-in-law Ron, his 
daughter-in-law, Gloria, and his grandchildren, uh, Paul, Tina, and Brendan. Now, a week or so ago, Michael pointed out that we're in an independent law school whose every resource is devoted to our mission of advancing the legal profession. The next milestone in Joe's life demonstrates this. Despite his family and work commitments, Joe was a very able law student. So able that when Joe graduated, Dean Carswell asked him to join the, the faculty as a law librarian and a teacher. This was another defining moment for Joe. So here we are at the point in the story at which Joe has realized his dream of becoming a lawyer with visions of $2 million fees dancing in his head. But instead of opting for the material rewards of private practice, he would opt to serve the law school and its students. As you've heard, the first court Joe taught was torts. Later, he added the, the course on bailments. Yes, there actually was a course on bailments at the time. And later, he took on commercial paper, legal research, bills and notes, corporations, and tax, among 15 other courses. Joe went to law school to become a taker, but he remained at Brooklyn Law, law School to spend his life as a giver. Improving Brooklyn Law School was Joe's vocation. Michael observed that we're an engaged law school with students and faculty to, committed to improving it. Joe was never shy about dispensing advice to deans, to faculty, and to students alike. He required no encouragement to speak up. And in the 1970s, at a critical juncture in Brooklyn Law School's history, Joe supplied the leadership and the vision, and equally important, the cohesiveness that allowed the law school to begin its transformation from a local school with limited ambitions for itself and its students into a modern law school with a national curriculum and faculty and students with similarly heightened aspirations. And he didn't just heighten those aspirations, he supported them. During that period, if other law schools that were attempting this transformation uh, were roiled by divisiveness, it's because they lacked the unifying unifying spirit of a Joe Crea. Many years ago, when Joe was asked what he has enjoyed most about his teaching career, he responded to students. And the feeling that we are doing something together, the feeling of community between students and instructor. Students, in turn, regarded Professor Crea as a supportive parent figure. Michael noted that Brooklyn Law School is a school of practical education that prepares people to do things out in the world. Joe understood the need to marry theory and practice in the classroom. Although he was not himself a scholar in the traditional sense, he understood the importance of scholarship and the need to support faculty members who engaged in it. He was an early and vocal supporter of clinical education, and of course he was the master of his own special brand of legal homily, one that made the CREA classroom experience very memorable as well as tartly amusing and highly instructive. Joe was dedicated to the educational process, to the law school, and not least uh, to the law. And he was not merely concerned with what was good for the institution, he also thought about people. When he decided that the law school was for him, Joe applied to every law school in New York City. BLS was the only one to admit him. When David Traeger was dean, and he was reflecting on the role of the law school in shaping the lives of its graduates, and especially those who, despite their intellect, were unable to gain admission to other law schools because of discriminatory admissions policies. David said that if Joe had been born in a different era, he would be the dean of Harvard Law School. But then, I pointed out, he wouldn't be Joe. Good evening, I'm Susan Herman and I have my Metro card with me if anyone wants to check it during the reception. It's a great honor to be here tonight to represent some of my colleagues on the faculty to pay tribute to Joe Crea and his truly remarkable life and, and experience at Brooklyn Law School. But it's also a great challenge to be following my eloquent colleagues, Michael Cahill, Stacey Kaplow, and Michael Gerber, because our memories and impressions of Joe are all so similar. So uh, Stacey Kaplow and I were comparing notes last week about what we thought we might say, 
And when we discovered that we really had you know, the same memories and you know, we were going to use the same language and say the same things, we talked briefly about whether we should stand up and do a duet. Well, we decided against that, so you're not going to get to see the choreography. But I started thinking about what it means that we all have such similar mem memories that everybody in this room, no matter what context you knew Joe Correa in, you knew the same person and you would have the same you know, similar memories and impressions. And I started to think that, as, even if it's a challenge for those of us who have to speak you know, fourth or whatever in the line, I think it's a real tribute to the character and integrity of this man. We've all known people who present a different face to people depending on whether they think of you as a peer or as maybe you know, somebody they might not perceive as an equal social status, like you're a student or a manager. And I think the fact that we all saw the same Joe Crea is really very meaningful. Um, if you were a person who knew one of those, you know, kind of shapeshifters or chameleons who kind of presented a different face to everyone, if different people stood up who knew that person in different contexts to talk about them, they would all be saying completely different things. It would sound like the blind men and the elephant, right? You know, but we're all saying the same thing, and we're all using the same language, no matter whether we, no matter when we met Joe during his very long career, no matter whether we knew him as students, colleagues, friends, you, know, etc. And so we're, that, I think that explains why, and I think it's a really positive thing that we all think of the word giver, and we all think of Joe's incredible engagement and humanity and what he meant to us as a person. And we all remember the same trademark Crayaisms, right? You've already heard already, you know, let the barrel roll. Um, you've heard never drop your briefcase and run. And then there was something about a pot stirrer that maybe somebody can remind me later how that went. That was another one that came up a lot. So I started teaching here a few years after Stacey Kaplow, and Joe was also a quintessential part of my everyday life. He also would pop into my office and sit in his chair. I almost thought of it as Joe's chair. And he would stop and chat, and he would tell me about the history of the law school. Right? I learned about the Pearl Street building where the law school used to be. And he would tell me about his own history at the law school. Uh, one story I remember was telling me about his, um, what, the day that the dean asked him to teach taxes. He said, yeah, I didn't know anything about taxes, but if you can teach, you can teach anything. So sure enough, Joe taught virtually every course in the curriculum. But I have to say he was not judgmental about us youngsters who wanted to specialize and really wanted to avoid teaching tax. So in addition to teaching us history, he also took on you know, our professional development. And as Michael Cahill was saying, there were a lot of advance sheets involved. <laughs> you got a lot of paper when you knew Joe. A lot of paper came into the office, too. So one thing that was remarkable is that you know, I taught in different fields from Michael. Arthur Pinto, who's here, I know, was also a beneficiary of the CREA advance sheet delivery system. And what was remarkable was that this system continued even after all those cases were available on the internet. And it's not as if Joe was not technologically adept. He was very quick to pick up that email. It was a really good way to communicate, even faster and with even more people. So. Uh, you know, if it hadn't already been said, I would tell you about how Joe was our chief cheerleader, he was our shop steward, he was the person who went to every dean and made sure that we were being given the salaries that he thought we should get. Um, but I, I also very quickly learned that Joe Crea was somebody who was a legend beyond the law school building. So when I was out in the world, either at law school events or just on the street, I would frequently run into Brooklyn Law School graduates. And one of the first questions that virtually every one of them would always ask me was, is Professor Crea still teaching there? Well, for many, many years, I was able to say yes. So then what followed that was the individual would very often tell me a story about how Joe Crea had been so important to their professional development or something he had, they had taught him in class. And then, inevitably, they would quote their favorite Joe Crea aphorism, let the barrel roll, never drop your briefcase and run. Okay, everybody knew the same Joe Crea. So Michael Gerber was just talking about when the law school became more of a national presence. And uh, this was partially, Michael didn't mention this specifically, but it was partially because Joe Crea convinced the dean that if you want rising stars of national your presence, you have to pay them higher salaries. So Joe was always going to the bat for that. But as Michael was also saying, and I'm going to tell you know, some of this again because it's something that I frequently tell um, people who are applying to teach at the law school. When people say to me, how come Brooklyn Law School has this extraordinarily collegial faculty? Or how did you avoid the hyperpartisanism that polarized so many other law schools and other educational institutions? And my answer was always, 
thank Joe Crea. So when um, newer faculty members were coming and doing different forms of scholarship, um, art, not just you know, case law annotations, but articles about jurisprudence, articles integrating behavioral psychology and family law, articles uh, examining the legal implications of the Coase theorem. Uh, some senior faculty members were not that delighted. And it might be because they didn't really value that kind of scholarship. They didn't see it as useful to lawyers. It might be because they were afraid that they would be marginalized if the law school came to value things that were not what they were doing. But there were a number of senior faculty members who started to you know, gripe a bit about, you know, what's this? This isn't real sco legal scholarship. Well, the way that we avoided the bitter polarization with the young Turks battling with you know, the old guard for control was that Joe Crea talked to all the members of the old guard, and he said, oh, come on, let the youngsters have their chance. You let them do it. It's fine. You know, get over it. And then he would talk to the young Turks, and he would say, OK, you, know, you do whatever you need to do for your professional development. But then he would also encourage us to respect and get along with our senior colleagues. So Joe Crea, in addition to the giver, I also think of him as a kind of a glue. He was kind of somebody who could put people together and really cause them to recognize their common humanity. So for as much of his 104 years as I could observe, Joe Crea was vibrant, generous in every way, intellectually engaged and ready to smile. As people have already said, but it bears repeating, he loved the law, he loved the law, stu law school, he loved his students, he loved his colleagues, but most of all, above all, he loved his family. Now I can tell you, that Joe Crea told all of us many stories about his family. And I will hasten to add that they were every single one positive and endearing. Because one thing about Joe Crea was he was such a positive person that he led you to believe that he wasn't leaving things out. There was just nothing negative to say about any of you, about any of us. I think it is telling that when Joe's beloved wife, Regina, died, the law school, with Joe's encouragement, instituted a Regina Crea Prize for a graduating law student. And what you had to do to win that prize was to be a giver. You had to be the graduating student who was deemed by the faculty to have been, done most in a disinterested way to build the institution. If there had been a prize for a faculty member who contributed most to the law school, Joe Crea would have won that prize every one of the over 60 years that he taught here. So I want to say, Joe, you will be missed. You will not be forgotten. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Hank Haverstick. Joe Cray and I were colleagues at the law school for 42 years. As the school's former dean of admissions, I had the pleasure of serving with Joe on the admissions committee for 36 of those years. And I'm honored to offer some remarks about our times together. During my retirement party in May 2015, the law school gave me several gifts. One was especially meaningful, a framed photograph of Joe. The photo shows him sitting at a table in my old office beside a birthday cake, decorated with the words, happy 97th birthday. The photo bears an, an inscription written by Joe, to Hank, from Joseph Crea and he dated it May 19, 2015. Actually, the picture was taken on April 26, 2012. The admissions committee was scheduled to meet that day, informed that it was Joe's birthday. I ordered the cake. We all sang happy birthday, and someone snapped a photo. I did not see the photo until my retirement three years later. Since then, it is hung on a wall in my home office. I look at Joe almost every day and probably will for the rest of my life. I felt that we were that close. I love Joe. The man had no pretensions. What you saw was what you got. He could be blunt and forceful, but you always knew where he stood on the issues and where you stood with him. He was completely unselfish, 
and amazingly generous. He made himself available when I never, when I, whenever I needed to hold a meeting or whenever I called him at his home, which was many times, to discuss applicants. He was always ready to help. And he was one of the hardest, most dedicated workers I knew. Between 1977 and 2015, numerous members of the faculty served on the admissions committee often for only a few years. Joe was the only constant, serving a remarkable 38 consecutive years. From January to August every year, the committee met weekly in my office. Invariably, Joe was the first to arrive. He and I used that free time to talk about politics, school matters, the state of admissions, BLS history, and investment strategies. I relish those conversations. In truth, though, our friendship was slow in taking root. As Brooklyn Law made its move from being a local law school to becoming a national law school, Joe and I had many disagreements about admission policy, particularly the increased use of law school admission test scores which I strongly advocated. Sometimes the disagreements grew so argumentative that I began to yearn for the man's retirement, which I was sure would come soon. <laughs> and that was in the early 1980s. Joe, you see, was the admissions committee's great humanist. In the, fa in the face of mounting pressure, to improve the LSAT profile of our entering students, Joe tirelessly fought for the overriding importance of evaluating each applicant's wholeness, elements such as life experience, economic background, the strength to overcome adversity, the pursuit of hard courses in college, and a track record of achievement. His paramount question was, does the applicant possess the drive to succeed? Our, de our debates about indicators of talent went on for years. And with the emergence of nationwide law school rankings, they only became more complicated. As more decisions to admit or deny hinged on very small differences in LSAT scores, Joe accused the committee of playing God with people's lives. He was our conscience. Through it all, however, we kept searching for common ground. We found ways to grow and learn together. Above all, we never stopped speaking candidly and sincerely. As the years passed, Joe and I became close friends with heartfelt respect for each other. And now I see much clearer than before how Joe was always trying to do what he perceived was best for Brooklyn Law School. There was never a personal agenda. Joe was one of the best at providing helpful advice. There was one thing he often told me, and I apply it in my life to this day. Never let the bastards wear you down. Through 104 years of an exceptional life, Joe never did. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Paul Mischlevitz. I'm uh, Joe's oldest grandson. When I was young, and I wrote that uh, without realizing how unhelpful it might be uh, to this crowd. So what I'll, what I'll clarify is, w when my age was in single digits, uh, I went to my grandpa Joe's house just about every Sunday uh, for dinner. And in addition to his and his daughter's uh, excellent Italian cooking, grandpa would provide us with advice in the form of stories. The stories, for the most part, were law stories. Uh, and most often, this will not surprise you, 
stories about how he used his authority as a professor or as a member of the admissions committee to give a chance or a second chance to someone who potentially hadn't earned it by the rules or who didn't have the scores, but who had uh, impressed him that they had some sort of virtue that made him believe that they deserved a chance and could earn it by his rules. At that time, I was a, a, a little kid, uh, and I thought that I was pretty tough, because I'm from Brooklyn, right? And I didn't understand why he was telling me these stories. Uh, usually, people tell you stories, or people tell me stories at least, I don't assume your experience, but they tell stories about how they defeated an opponent to wow you with their prowess, or they tell you about how they were mistreated to get sympathy. But Joe's stories were not either of those. Then, uh, I went to college in Virginia, and I joined the Army ROTC program. I learned how to set Claymore mines, uh, fire rocket launchers, lead squads through the woods on infantry attacks, on machine gun positions, uh, et cetera. And then uh, there was one December break, I think in my second year, when uh, two of my friends from Army ROTC, Phil and Clay, came uh, with me to New York because they wanted to know what all the hype was about with New Year's uh, in Manhattan. And we had dinner with my grandpa, and that was the first time that I remember that he told us Army stories. Uh, he told us how uh, when the war broke out, uh, the Second World War, he signed up for the infantry so that he could fight the Nazis. And then instead, he was uh, assigned to train black soldiers in the South, which was a relatively non-prestigious assignment. Uh, he told me how he was the only northern officer in the group. The rest of the uh, officers there he described as, as good old boys. Uh, and he told me how he was the only one among the white officers who treated the black soldiers like equals as much as the rank structure of the army would allow. How he let them call their own cadences, let them lead their own squads, and otherwise govern themselves like any white soldier would have been able to. And then he also told us how the other white officers felt about that and how the establishment treated him in response about the reprisals he suffered from the other white officers. Uh, and he laughed, uh, he thought it was funny at least, when he told us how those Southern officers would call him the ninja from Brooklyn. Though, as a footnote, I have to uh, tell you in candor, that's not the exact word they used. Uh, he told us how his weekend passes were taken away to make him peel potatoes in the kitchen, or as he put it, I did KP many weekends. He told us how when those black soldiers finally got fed up with their abuse that they were suffering, and rioted, uh, burning down several of the buildings in the barracks area, his platoon declined to participate in the uprising. So after college, the, the way ROTC works is that you get commissioned uh, on the day before you graduate. So I was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the infantry uh, in, in May of 2001. And uh, as you probably uh, realize, we had a war that started soon after. So I was put in charge of my rifle platoon in the 3rd Infantry Division, uh, and it was soon after that that I realized that there are two kinds of military officers. There are officers who uh, try to please their bosses on the backs of their troops, and there are military officers who annoy their bosses by trying to secure better treatment and better safety for their troops. Uh, I think you can probably guess which uh, Joe was and which I, uh, in turn, tried to be. It was then, <clears throat> after all those years, that I finally understood the point of those stories after dinner. I finally understood why those stories, stories about helping people who he never expected would be able to help him back, caused my curmudgeon of a grandpa to grin with nostalgia. He, he was teaching me not how to avoid personal hardship, not how to defeat personal enemies or opponents, but how to use my strengths and abilities to help people who couldn't do it for themselves. It was he who taught me to stick by people who are counting on me, no matter how unsure I might be about what I should do or how I should do it, or as I'm sure you've already heard, don't drop your briefcase and run. It was my grandpa who taught me from before I was old enough to understand it that the best way to stand 
against a cruel and demanding world is to be unrepentantly generous, forgiving, and kind. And I wanted you to know that about it. Thank you. I'm here to talk about a student. What I've been hearing all night is his colleagues and other professors. Now I'm going to tell you about Alan Grubman, which in those days was Alan Grubman. But I elevated it to Grubman at a certain point. I'm one of the luckiest people who ever graduated Brooklyn Law School. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Professor Crayer. He changed my life. Now I'll tell you how it happened. It's, it's become a, a pretty famous story in, in the media world because people have many times said to me, how did you build your practice? So basically, the first term at Brooklyn Law School, there were two credits, two courses, six credit courses. Courts and contracts. If you failed either one of them, finished, done, gone. I take the torts final. There's a 40-point essay, and I have a mental block. Whatever I wrote was not legible. So I walk out of the final saying, well, that's the end of it. My career as a lawyer is over. My whole family was in the schmata business, and I said, I guess I'm going to be another salesman in the garment business. My friend Stewie, who's here tonight, said, call Professor Crea. Tell him what happened and see what he says. What do you have to lose? So in those days, you opened up a telephone book. And I looked, Joseph Crea, I think he, I think at Bedford Avenue, wherever it was. I call him up. I said, Professor Crayer, it's Alan, Grub Alan Grubman. Who are you? I said, I was in your torts class. You were in my torts class. I don't recognize the name. He didn't recognize the name because I never once raised my hand. I was sitting in that room doing what I was doing. And so I said, Professor Crayer, let me tell you what happened. I took the final, had a mental block for, on the essay, and when you read it, it'll sound like Yiddish. So he says to me, I don't know who you are, Grubman, but I'll tell you what, I'll, this is the deal we're gonna make. Go pass the rest of your, go get, don't take the rest of your finals and get at least C's, and I'll give you a D instead of an F. I did that, and today I am a lawyer. I'm a lawyer in the entertainment business. And if it wasn't for him, as I said, God knows what I would be today. And I really owe him, I mean, I don't know how many other students owe him a debt, but I am telling all of you here that if it wasn't for Joseph Crea and the generosity he showed me on, that, on the telephone that day, I wouldn't be here today. Okay, so now I move on, I become an entertainment lawyer, and I done very well. About 20 years ago, I get a call from Dean Traeger. So one of my assistants says, Dean Traeger's on the phone. I reverted to being a student. I said, oh, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? He's calling me. And he calls me up and he says, I'd like to see you. I said, of course. He comes to my office with these big tubes under his arm. And he comes into my office and he sits down, he looks around. He says, you know, you've never made a contribution to the law school. And like I was six years old, I go, you're right, you're right. He said, do you have a conference room here? He said, I said, yeah, next door. He said, can I go in? I go into the conference room, takes these tubes, opens them up, and shows me the plans for the new building. And I had already made up my mind it's time. 
So he shows me the plans, and I see this double height ceiling. <clears throat> I said, what is that? He said, that, that's going to be the library. The library. He says, yes, on the main floor, you'll have the desks for the students and a ramp around the second floor where all the books are. I said, wow, that looks beautiful. So then we got into a, like a two-minute negotiation. I had decided this is what I'm going to do. So we agree. I say to him, how is, what's, what's, what's happening with Joe Prayer? What's, what's the story? Is he still teaching? Yes, Alan. He's teaching. He's not teaching a lot of courses. I think he's teaching ethics, et cetera, et cetera. I said, I'm naming the library. I'm naming the library after Joseph Crane. He says, why? And I told him the story. He said, that's really wonderful. He said, is there anything unique about the library? I asked Stu if I can say this. He says, why not? I said, it's the one room in the building I never walked into. <laughs> I was an absolutely terrible student. I was, my, my brain stopped working when I absorbed enough information to get a C. And then it stopped working. So a week later, I get a call. Professor Cray, my, assist, my assistant says, Professor Gray, Cray is on the phone. I said, oh, great. He gets on the phone. Now remember, I spoke to him 20, 25 years before we did the library. And he gets on the phone. He says, Grubman, I remember that call on Sunday like it was yesterday. <laughs> he must have had thousands of phone calls like that. And I said, Professor, it's really an honor and a privilege to do this for you. And um, basically, that's my story. And it's a fantastic story, not because of me, but because of him. He was a unique individual. And what makes my wife and I happy, I never get emotional. I mean, if any, unfortunately, nobody in this room knows me. But I am the least emotional person in the world, but at least for the rest of, as long as this building is standing, the name Joseph Crayer will be on that library. And I owe him a great debt. I'm finished with my story. Can I put this back? <laughs> Uh, this, obviously, this evening is a great evening, and it's uh, wonderful to have heard all the wonderful professors and uh, people before us. It's nice to finish off with two C students, though. <laughs> and uh, um, <laughs> this is a wonderful celebration. Uh, and again, the only element uh, that is missing uh, is the man himself but he's within all of us, in our hearts, in our brains, and with thousands of others, so he's here tonight. I would like to, as they've already been welcomed, but I wrote it down, so I'd like to welcome the family and the friends, and of course, the Brooklyn Law School family. As you know, and can gather from previous speakers, we're here tonight to remember and pay tribute to a truly magnificent person. Many of us were fortunate to be associated with this amazing institution that commenced something like 118 years ago and has risen to, lead, to a leading law school in many, many categories. A, tr a prime driving participant in this accomplishment was Joe Crea, who similarly started with nothing but his own uniqueness. He and others 
help bring a law school for economically limited people to where it is today. Positioned right now and going forward, but positioned for future educational heights. Joe started in 1944 and graduated in 1947. His association with the school was for the past 75 years because it didn't stop. It was, he was associated with the school till the day he passed. You think there's a, a little coincidence that the school rose from nothing and Joe was part of it for 75 years? I think there's a causal connection. One story Joe loved to tell concerned the economic value of the school. I believe that what follows took place somewhere around oh, the mid-60s. I think it was about 1965 or 66. At the time, 250 Jerolliman Street, the building we're in, and 110 Livington, Livingston Street, which is the building behind us, were two adjacent vacant lots. The school um, was, the school, the city was basically providing the property for the school for not a lot of money. I think it was $750,000. And the school wanted this property. Joe went to Dean Prince at the time and said, in essence, what are you, crazy? We should take both properties. And the dean nicely explained to Joe, you don't understand, we're not in the real estate business. Uh, that would have probably been the most significant endowment builder we could have had. Um, and uh, clearly, we've benefited from other real estate that we've had in the, in the area, in the Brooklyn Heights area. Joe was very instrumental in pushing for the acquisition of the various residential buildings we had and that we ultimately sold because the board decided, hopefully at the right time, we're not in the real estate business. As to my group's experience, guys I went to school with and uh, Stan Kaplan and Alan Weiner are here tonight, we were the evening class of 68. We and when, that's when we graduated. We started in 64, and that's when we first met Joe. We began to hang out we were before class around 5, 5.15 to 6 in the old building on Pearl Street. Uh, and it was a group of us, about you know 10 or 12 of us, in the cafeteria on the seventh floor. Joe came, introduced himself, and sat down with us every night for those four years. The subject matters of our conversations had no restrictions and did not include insight on how to handle certain, oh, it did include insight, I'm sorry, on how to handle certain courses and professors. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. <laughs> he was, he had, as you know, Joe had an opinion and wasn't afraid to express it. Among his many stories and, and all of us have, I'm sure, tons of them, particularly the family. The one that was near and dear was concerned his neighborhood. Joe created an investment club in his local neighborhood, which was made up of blue collar workers who really didn't have a lot of money at all. He created a savings fund and made, I wasn't going to say ask, made, because he was adamant about this, made his friends give him a small amount of money each week, which he invested primarily in blue chip companies. Joe, by the way, was quite astute at this effort and wound up earning significant returns and basically forced the neighbors to have savings at the end of the day. He was wonderful for the people in his community. Following Joe's example, my smart group created a uh, law school investment fund. Some of our classmates, unfortunately, were stockbrokers. With their acumen, 
We did miserably compared to Joe, <laughs> miserably. And he used to sit there and just gleam. <laughs> Joe and I have been friends for 55 years. You've heard tonight how Joe helped Alan, which was amazing, but that was not, that was not a one-off. Joe did this for many, not quite Alan's story, but for many students that had temporary problems, which could have cost them their education and, of course, their careers. Over the years, I got into varied discussions about the school and its movement forward and what I was doing with, in business. Joe would talk about everything. Joe always wanted, he had an opinion. And we also talked about world events. In 1991, I was asked to join the law school board. I know why. This was Joe making then judge, but then Dean David Traeger crazy to put me on the board. And of course, Joe immediately began to give me advice for the next three decades on how to deal with the school. Aside from law, Joe had various interests. He was really a, an unbelievable individual. One surprise, aside from the cigars, which I appreciated, one surprising, one that was surprising to me was he loved thoroughbred racing. I'm, I'm with a bunch of lawyers here, but I have, to, I have to talk about this. As a complete neophyte in the early 1990s, I went into the breeding and racing aspects of the sport. I raced horses. Joe was my instant advisor and critic. As a result of that colloquially, over the years, I made Joe a partner in three different horses. Craya's Law, Craya Can Do, and Craya's Brooklyn Law. These horses were moderately successful, not much. And I made Joe a, a partner, and every cent of winnings that he got, every share he got, went to the Regina and Joseph Craya Memorial Fund at the school. He always gave it to the school. Joe would follow the horses even after I sold them. And he used to take pleasure in informing me that they had won. And why did I let them go? <laughs> I recently turned over the chairmanship of the school's board, of course, with the approval of the board, to Frank Aquila. I could not have done this earlier without incurring Joe's formidable wrath. Now, Frank, you know why I waited. <laughs> Joe, with a great heart and brain, had and will continue to have enormously positive effects on the lives of thousands of people. There aren't enough words to capture Joe's uniqueness. As a weak attempt, I'd like to throw out just a few. He had a huge heart. He was extraordinarily intelligent, selfless, supportive, dedicated, mindful, focused, humorous, animated, enthusiastic, and a ton of gumption, and of course he was in love with his family, his friends, and the law school. He was a product and a builder of this great educational home. I am proud to say he was my Goomba, and really the personification of a mensch. Thank you.